Tonight, double jabs or double standards. Anger over a last-minute vaccine passport backflip. The chief health officer excluding the AFLW's crowd from the order. Either do it properly or you don't. To have 5,000 people versus 300, it just seems really unfair. Plus, shelves stripped bare at Perth supermarkets as the supply chain crisis hits WA. Tonight, the new plan to ease stock shortages. Novak Djokovic's COVID claims called into question the failed bid to delay his court hearing. Fears for a missing teenager swept away in Queensland's flood emergency. Frightening underwater footage of mass abalone deaths at Ocean Reef. And Ash Barty's warning sign ahead of the Open with a crushing victory. This is Nine News Perth with Natalia Cooper. Good evening. Perth nightclub owners are accusing the McGowan government of double standards after a proof of vaccination backflip at last night's AFLW Derby. Health advice was changed at the last minute for almost 6,000 fans, struggling businesses demanding consistent rules. The rivalry remains, but there was no bad blood about footy's new must-have ticket. Thousands rolling in for a round one derby with vaccine passports at the ready, but they weren't needed, leaving many surprised and infuriating those doing the right thing. I think it definitely is double standards. Um, it just, there's no, I mean, you, there's no other explanation. Nightclub owner Chris Patton says the decision to remove proof of vaccination for 5,500 fans is unfair when his industry has been impacted by its introduction. Northbridge has just been a ghost town. Um, you, the people that are coming out are just confused. The legislation is just not clear enough that you need to be double vaxxed. We're turning away one out of four, one out of three people because they're single vaxxed and you turn them away, their whole friend group leaves. Just days ago, the Dockers website was reminding fans over the age of 16 to provide proof of their double dose vaccination. But just before the gates opened, the Chief Health Officer excluded the game from the order because it was a seated, family-friendly outdoor event with lower alcohol consumption and limited mixing of groups. Do we have one set of rules for an outdoor event like Perth Cup and then a different set of rules for an outdoor event like AFLW. So it's really disappointing and it, people lose faith in the health advice. A state government spokesperson says the Perth Cup is a different event to an AFLW match and took place a week ago under different restrictions when the Delta backpacker outbreak was at a concerning stage. That's despite another new case linked to that Perth cluster today, a close contact who has been isolating. There's still cases around in the background so things haven't changed that drastically. So I think you either do it properly or you don't. Further Omicron transmission in WA has been avoided for now with 27 close contacts of the Hyatt Hotel case all testing negative. New South Wales recorded its deadliest day of the pandemic. 16 people died from COVID with 30,062 new cases as hospital presentations increase across the country. We just don't have enough separate wards and, and isolation rooms with negative pressure to actually separate people once that community prevalence becomes very high. Tomorrow, the long wait for kids to be vaccinated ends with child Pfizer available for 5 to 11-year-olds. But many young students won't be fully vaxxed until at least March. Queensland already announcing it will delay the start of its school year by two weeks. It is not desirable to have our children back starting school during the peak of this wave. Omicron is less severe. We can manage. I think it's possible to get as many children back to school as possible. And Joshua Dor, there's a push for more parents to book in. Yeah, there certainly is, Natalia. Already around 17,500 kids aged 5 to 11 have been booked in at state-run clinics over the next 30 days. But the state government says it has enough child Pfizer supply uh, for more than 33,000 doses and is encouraging parents to make sure they book in before term one. Now, walk-ins will still be accepted at some clinics, like here at Claremont. Uh, but the advice is if you don't want to be waiting in a line or miss out altogether, try to hunt around, find an appointment booking. If you can't find one at your local clinic, do search around. There are plenty of appointments uh, over the next few weeks as more Commonwealth supply comes online. And also continue to look at your GP or pharmacist as that might be the best option for parents. Natalia? Josh, thank you.
COVID is causing WA supermarket shelves to be stripped bare, but this time it's not because of panic buying. Isolating workers in the eastern states have been sparking a supply chain crisis, but relief could be on the way. The nation's food supply chain crisis has officially reached WA. Woolworths Averley stripped of meat, bread and tinned food. Ellenbrook low on frozen goods. At Woolworths and Coles in Subiaco, milk and toilet paper are hard to come by. Oh yeah, with nappies, we don't find, uh, you know, the right size. At times it kind of, yeah, just not too much there. A little bit through standard toilet paper and the... Um uh, rice and spaghetti and those kind of things. As COVID soars in the eastern states, workers are being forced into isolation because they're infected or close contacts. Suppliers like farmers, abattoirs and factories struggling to get their goods to market. A lack of delivery drivers further slowing down the process of getting stock into distribution centres and from there across the country to WA shop fronts. The bulk of our challenges are in fresh produce as well as in poultry um, and in some protein lines. WA's IGA stores still running smoothly but bracing. If one of those people aren't there the whole thing breaks down. If there are already supply issues now it begs the question how bad will it get when WA reopens come February 5 with the Premier yet to announce any plans to prevent distribution setbacks. New South Wales today deeming critical food supply workers who are close contacts exempt from isolation if they have no symptoms and return a negative test but their union says the move is fraught with danger. Close contacts are the most likely in our community to be carrying the virus and just because they're asymptomatic, it doesn't mean they can't pass it on. Kelly Haywood, Nine News. The Home Affairs Minister has tried to postpone tomorrow's ruling in Novak Djokovic's court case. As a legal expert predicts, the federal government will try to drag out the saga. It'll be decided if he's allowed to play in the Australian Open unvaccinated based on a previous COVID infection, which he seemed to ignore for days as he mingled with the public. <laughs> By his own admission, this is an infectious Novak Djokovic on the day he tested positive. Then, two days later, he's on stage. A week later, a hit of tennis with a fan when presumably he should have been isolating. And yet, that previous COVID infection could be his ticket into the Australian Open unvaccinated, even if home affairs tries to block him. There's a very high likelihood that the Commonwealth would seek to appeal this matter if they were to lose, which would just further extend proceedings again. Home Affairs Minister Karen Andrews already failing to postpone tomorrow's hearing as supporters offer their verdict. <laughs> Around 100 protesters, some anti-vax, rallying outside Kirribilli House, as others have done at Novak's detention hotel. <laughs> Novak's lawyers will argue it was procedurally unfair and legally unreasonable to cancel his visa, though the 35 pages of their legal argument paint no one in a good light. Novak claims he tested positive on December 16 before being photographed posing with children maskless at an awards ceremony and at a photo shoot for a French newspaper. As for the federal government, the lawyers claim it's changed its tune, granting a visa to Djokovic on November 18 before writing to him on January 1 saying he met the requirements for a quarantine-free arrival into Australia, but perhaps crucially, it's where permitted by the jury jurisdiction of your arrival, that being Victoria. And then there's Tennis Australia. Novak's lawyers say it gave him a medical exemption to vaccination on December 30, even though the deadline for every other player was December 10. Certainly, I think the Australian authorities are responsible for what has happened. They have not been clear in what they've done and they seem to have moved the goalposts. A complex case, but the judge will rule on a simple question. Does a previous infection automatically grant a vaccine exemption? That becomes the critical legal and factual issue, it seems to me. Adam Hegarty, Nine News. All right, it's time to go to Europe correspondent Brett McLeod, who is live for us in Belgrade. Brett, it'll be the middle of the night there when this case hits the court, uh, but Serbians will be watching closely. Certainly will be Natalia. You can probably tell on the ground behind me it's freezing here, but 
things get even frostier when you talk about Australia, and particularly the Australian government and Tennis Australia. People are very angry about their number one sporting hero here uh, being kept in detention. Uh, there's been more protests on the street in the last 24 hours, organised by Novak Djokovic's family. His father speaking, saying that he feels the decision to keep him in detention is a political one. There may be more protests today, but certainly when the decision is being handed down, it will be midnight local time. Now, whatever way it goes and whether that's the end of the matter, the fact is that with the world's number one tennis player, who some argue is the best player of all time, currently as we speak, still in detention in Melbourne, that won't be forgotten in Serbia anytime soon. Okay, okay Brett, thank you. A bushfire in Perth's hills has threatened lives and homes and there are fears tonight it was the work of an arsonist. It's the second blaze to burn in Warraloo in two weeks. Michael Stamp, firefighters are still on scene. They are, Natalia, and the blaze is still burning out of control. An emergency warning was in place where lives and homes were under threat, but that has since been downgraded to a watch and act. The fire started just after 3 o'clock this afternoon. So far, five hectares have been burnt. Firefighters have been quick to determine the cause of the blaze as suspicious. This is just two weeks after a Boxing Day arson attack destroyed a home and sheds. It's also been a year since 86 homes were lost in the devastating fires in Wooroloo last year. Several roads have been closed while firefighters strengthen containment lines tonight. Natalia? Yeah, you've got a feel for the people of Wooroloo, Michael. Thank you. The election campaign has begun in earnest with the opposition leader touring key seats Labor must win to form government. In an exclusive interview with Nine News, Anthony Albanese has promised free rapid antigen tests for all through Medicare. Banana leaves as far as the eye can see. The tropical paradise of far north Queensland is fertile campaign ground ahead of the federal election. What are you doing up here? The alternative Prime Minister on a mission to convince voters it's time for new leadership. I think the country just needs Please. a change in direction. Labor needs to pick up an additional seven seats to form a majority government and is hoping to win some of those in Queensland. But a disastrous result at the 2019 poll has left a sea of blue in regional parts of the state. The Liberals and Nationals comfortably hold the seats of Capricornia, Dawson and Herbert, but Labor believes Flynn and Leichhardt are in reach. I believe we'll have a program that will gain strong support uh, here in Queensland. Sitting down with Nine News, the opposition leader argues the government has mishandled the Omicron wave as cases explode across the country. Workers unable to go to work, hospitals struggling to have enough staff and supermarket shelves which are empty. This is uh, probably the most uh, uh, important challenge that has come from Omicron. Timely, affordable and available testing is another challenge. Labor has pledged to offer free rapid antigen tests to everyone through Medicare, but won't say if it'll still be party policy come election time. We think that the crisis is right now and people need access to these tests right now. Getting your hands on these tests could become a little easier from this week. An extra seven million are set to arrive for the national stockpile. The Commonwealth is expecting uh, to be able to provide over the, uh, the coming weeks uh, 10 million to the states. In this battleground state and elsewhere, Labor wants an election fight on two fronts. Of whether this government is competent, but it'll be also fought on who's offering a better future for Australia. Hoping voters will be in his corner when they head to the ballot box by May. Eliza Edwards, Nine News. A young rider has been killed in a horror smash in our northern suburbs. The 20-year-old lost control of his off-road motorbike on a cycle path near Tonkin Highway in Mushe just before 3 o'clock this morning. Police say he was travelling around a bend but crashed into a fence. Emergency crews were called to the scene but he couldn't be saved. Major crash officers are investigating. A-League star Josh Cavallo has suffered homophobic abuse during a clash in Adelaide. The world's first openly gay, ma gay male professional footballer says there are no words to describe how disappointed he is. Exiting the game after being poked in the eye, Josh Cavallo's then subjected to something far more hurtful. Homophobic slurs hurled at the Adelaide United defender by fans during the one-all draw with Melbourne victory at their home ground. 
Cavallo posting on Instagram this morning. I'm not going to pretend that I didn't see or hear the homophobic abuse at the game last night. Hate will never win. I will never apologise for living my truth. In October, the then 21-year-old became the first openly gay top-tier men's footballer after bravely uttering these simple words. Hi everyone, it's Josh Cavallo here. I'm at my home here in Adelaide. There's something personal that I need to share with everyone. I'm a footballer and I'm gay. In taking that step, he united two worlds that for more than a century had never crossed paths. Messages of support instantly flowed from celebrities and football stars across the globe. The response and support I have received is <laughs> immense. It's starting to make me think that why have I been hiding this burden for so long? Adelaide United has released a statement saying it's appalled by the homophobic abuse Josh received from fans at Amy Park last night. It says Josh continues to show immense courage and we join him in calling out this abuse which has no place in society. Melbourne Victory also releasing a statement saying spectators found to have breached these standards will be banned from future matches. The Professional Footballers Association has also offered Josh Cavallo their full support. Both clubs are working with the A-League to identify the perpetrators. Cam Inglis, Nine News. There are grave fears for a 14-year-old girl swept away in Queensland floodwaters. Helicopters have been searching desperately for the teenager who was taking shelter on a tree with her father yesterday afternoon. Neighbours pulled the man to safety, but his daughter hasn't been seen since. Dozens of locals have been rescued with parts of the state tonight in the grips of an emergency. It was Mary Bra's last line of defence, a levee hundreds of metres long in the centre of town. But this afternoon, Mary Bra lost the battle. So the walls that slow and prevent the water backing up from the river have failed um, and the pumps can't keep up with that. With the town's evacuation siren wailing, <laughs> business owners rushed into the CBD to save what they could. Tonight, Maryborough is a disaster zone. Each of these businesses are being inundated from the ground up. The floodwater rising through the stormwater system. Council predicts it could potentially reach the top of the street sometime tonight. Right now we're working with all the businesses to get their, um, their inventory out and to help sandbag. Swift water rescue teams have been swamped. I was just busy moving everything up uh, so that the water can go through the second level of the house. And... Uh, I was going to ride it out, but they've, because they've raised the river level expectations, it was time to go. Locals even manning their own boats to rescue people caught out by the torrent. And mate, it's not just property that you're saving, you just heard yesterday you saved a couple of kids. Yeah, yeah, um, and, and that shakes people up. From the air, you can see the magnitude that confronts locals. The Mary River, twice its size, on par with levels in 2013 and getting wider by the hour. Last-minute sandbagging was a waste of time. Street after street covered in water, home after home swamped. Yachts have broken their moorings, jetties washed downstream. South of town, just near Gympie, hundreds of cars stranded on the Bruce Highway after it was cut again. But right now, all eyes remain on Maryborough. Locals holding their collective breath, waiting for what's in store tonight. In Maryborough, Jordan Fabris, Nine News. Elizabeth Creasy is here with your weather details and Liz, it was a mild summer day for Perth. It was Natalia, it has been very cool for Perth. Our top temperature was just 25 degrees this afternoon and our overnight low was 16. They are the coolest conditions we've had in the city since mid-December. Not one suburb making it into the 30s today. Bullsbrook was the warmest spot to be with a maximum of just 27.7. The cooler conditions are mostly thanks to the strong southerly winds that really picked up yesterday and continued continued right through to today. Gusts getting up to 76 kilometres an hour at Rottnest, 61 at Ocean Reef and about 50 in Mandurah. It is remaining pretty mild tomorrow, but it is warming up a lot midway through the week. I will have that forecast for you soon, Natalia. Thanks so much.
Next, an ocean fight in Perth's northern suburbs. Why residents are blaming mass abalone deaths on a major marina. Plus, trapped in their cars in freezing conditions, a snowy traffic jam turns deadly. A huge funding boost for research into the rarest diseases. And later, how to use a rapid antigen test, a step-by-step -step guide as WA lifts its ban. An outcry over abalone has erupted at Ocean Reef with underwater footage capturing the delicacy dead under the new marina. Locals say it's a heartbreaking contrast to what used to be one of WA's richest coastal hotspots. Ocean Reef is one of WA's coastal gyms. Panoramic views attracting multi-million dollar luxury homes, but underwater tells a different story. Countless dead abalone in a now lifeless reef that used to look like this. So we're going to lose this reef. Locals capturing not just dead abalone, but other marine life too. It's not just the um, reef, it's also the three surf breaks that are going to go. Um, for what? For the biggest project along our coastline in decades. Shops, restaurants, apartments and a 550 berth marina. One of my mates goes, Diving and you've seen a lot more dead abalone than alive, which is definitely a sad thing. We've got a new uh, environment minister. We've written to him. I would like to see the government and the council come down and have another look at what they're doing here. Although not all locals are against the development. They've done Hillary, they've done Mindari, that's all been done. They've done two rocks marinas, so this is another marina. I think it's going to be great when it's completed. The state government says around 170,000 abalone were relocated safely to new homes between Trigg and Hillary's. This to make way for the $120 million marina development expected to be completed next year. Commercial abalone divers hired to carefully collect and drop back the prized shellfish, a huge project that has been given the environmental green light. Yeah, if they have and they've survived, good, but if they're dying, that's sad. Zarisha Bradley, Nine News. A desperate search is tonight underway for a 26-year-old man missing in our Great Southern. Police and SES have flooded the Stirling Range National Park after Mohammed Ferdian Sar's ute was found abandoned in a car park yesterday morning. It's believed he may be in the area of Mount Tulbrunup, around 80 kilometres rather north of Albany, which is the second highest peak. Police helicopter and drones have been deployed, but there have been no signs of the 26-year-old. The search will continue overnight. The federal government is providing $63.4 million to help fight the rarest forms of cancer and disease. 27 grants will be handed out to support clinical trials and new research. That includes amazing programs on precision medicine, precision medicine being where the individual's specific condition is diagnosed and the medicine is tailored for them. Among the funding, $1.5 million, which will go to the University of New South Wales to study high-risk childhood cancer. A heavy snowstorm has claimed the lives of nearly two dozen tourists at a popular winter resort in Pakistan. The icy blast froze roads, leaving people with no way out. They came to see the record snowfall close up, but bumper to bumper on this remote and winding road, whiteout closed in. Thousands of tourists trapped at the mountainside town of Murray, northeast of Islamabad. A heavy dump more than a metre deep, smothering vehicles and felling trees. Inside these gridlock cars, at least 22 people dead. The country's interior minister leading the emergency response. Overnight, a thousand vehicles moved. Now, he says, heavy snow clearing machinery is being brought in. The army shifting cars and people on foot. An Islamabad police officer, his six children and wife among the dead. They and others believed to have suffered carbon monoxide poisoning, heating their vehicle as the temperature dropped to negative eight. 
Winter snow has long attracted tourists to Murray. This year, tens of thousands of people crammed the town before trying to flee. The country's opposition accusing the government of failing to manage the influx. Prime Minister Imran Khan tweeting, unprecedented snowfall and rush of people proceeding without checking weather conditions caught district admin unprepared. But with a popular tourist town so quickly becoming a deadly tourist trap, a high-level inquiry is underway. Ruth Wynne williams Nine News. The UK has become the first country in Europe to record more than 150,000 COVID deaths, although figures from the Office for National Statistics suggest it is closer to 174,000. The country has the seventh highest toll worldwide after the US, Brazil, India, Russia, Mexico and Peru. Meantime, Mexico has reached a grim milestone of its own, passing 300,000 deaths. COVID hospitalizations of children under the age of five are at their highest level since the pandemic began in the US. The age group is not eligible for vaccines and is four times more likely to be treated in hospital than older children who are eligible. Health officials maintain the symptoms of Omicron are still far less severe than Delta. Next, holiday disaster, the horrifying moment a rock slide crushes a boat full of tourists. Plus, a princess released from prison, why she was locked up for years without being charged. The Duchess of Cambridge strikes a pose for her 40th birthday. And the young tennis lovers preparing for an important role at the Open. Seven tourists have been killed after a giant rock formation crashed onto boats in a Brazilian lake. Bad weather is tonight hampering search efforts for three others still missing. A boat full of tourists desperately trying to signal for attention. As they spot rocks sliding down the cliff face. A towering slab slices away and plummets into the water below hitting four boats carrying at least 34 people. Captured from multiple angles, sending a wall of water like a bomb blast in the canyon. <laughs> we are doing our search work on the surface of the water, in the water with the divers. The investigative work will continue. The remains of the boats below now barely recognisable, officials confirming they are still trying to figure out the identities of some of the missing. The Navy launching an investigation. Furnas Lake, 420 kilometres north of Sao Paulo, is a popular area for tourists. The towering 20 metre high cliffs composed of sedentary rock, making them more susceptible to bad weather. Locals questioning why these holidaymakers were sailing so close to them given recent heavy rains in the area, already resulting in rock slides, <coughs> submerging nearby towns, leaving hundreds of residents homeless. Alison Petrowski, Nine News. COVID outbreaks have sent nearly 500 aged care homes across the country into lockdown and infected more than 1,000 elderly residents in the past three weeks. The health minister says booster jabs are being rolled out to the 2,600 residential facilities ahead of schedule. At this stage, we have over 1,500 uh, that have received the boosters and all facilities have either received the boosters or are scheduled on the advice that I have from Operation COVID Shield the number of infected aged care staff has also jumped to 1,800 nationally, causing major workforce shortages. A teacher in Texas has been charged with child endangerment for locking her COVID-positive son in the car boot to visit a testing clinic. The mother claims she was isolating from her 13-year-old. The nurse refused to test him unless he was in the back seat and the nurse called police. A prominent Saudi Arabian princess and her daughter have been released from jail three years after they were arrested without charge. Princess Basma bin Saud's family claims she was targeted because she was an outspoken critic of the kingdom's treatment of women. She had been on her way to Switzerland for medical treatment when 
when she was detained and says she was denied medical care for a potentially life-threatening condition when in custody. The Duchess of Cambridge has marked her 40th birthday with three stunning photos channeling iconic black and white images of Queen Elizabeth and Princess Diana. Kate, well she looks relaxed in the series that was taken at Kew Gardens. The pictures will be put in the permanent collection at the National Portrait Gallery of which the Duchess is patron. Absolutely beautiful. They're the unsung heroes of the Australian Open and today the ball kids were treated to a big surprise. One of the favourites to win this year's Grand Slam, Stefano Tsitsipas, popped in to say hi, armed with a confession. This is what's known as a tennis roll call. Some of the best ball boys and girls ready to hit the court for the Open. When you see the players, when someone holds up the, the trophy, you realise I was a part of that, you know, I helped them get to that moment. It's always been a dream of mine since the age of eight. And players like Stefano Tsitsipas can't thank them enough. It's been a privilege, thank you. A big kid at heart, the Greek sensation is one of the most popular players at Melbourne Park, but as a ball kid... You'd bring your elbow down. Yeah. He makes a great tennis player. I was a ball kid in my local tennis club. We weren't as good as you guys. We made plenty of mistakes. A record 380 volunteers aged between 12 and 16 have been enlisted for this year's Grand Slam. But making the grade isn't easy. From thousands of hopefuls, only a select few are recruited during annual trials. I was like, oh, I had a good crack at it. I didn't think I did that well, but here I am today. In 45 minute shifts, they do it all. Fetch towels, trap bugs and deliver balls. In short, they're here to help. One of my favourites to work with is Naomi Osaka. I was with her a few times last year, absolute nicest player. From Naomi to Rafa to Ash, they're constantly rubbing shoulders with the best and all from the best seats in the house. You see a player and that no one knew about and then in a few years they could be AO champ. A small army of legends who always seem to have a ball. Clint Stanaway, Nine News. WA's ban on rapid antigen tests lifts tomorrow. The kits will be available to buy in pharmacies. So how do you properly use one? Expert advice ahead. And living to 180 years old. Why scientists say it could soon be a reality. I'm not sure I want to live that long. <laughs> First Bonnie Rayner is here in sport and Bonnie, it was a nail-biting finish at the SCG. It was, Natalia. It came down to the final ball. Australia falling one wicket short of victory as England held on in a thriller. A dramatic draw. The visitors unable to watch as their tail-enders got the job done. Barty crowned the best in Adelaide. Ash adding another trophy to the cabinet. And meet the Perth product blitzing World Cycling's most prestigious race in half the peloton's time. Australia has missed its chance at an Ashes series sweep with England's tailenders holding on for a dramatic draw at the SCG. The visitors nine down at the death, leaving Stuart Broad and Jimmy Anderson to survive the final overs. Victorian Scott Boland once again impressing with three wickets. Australia needed to be ruthless on the final day. This time in action, this time it's down. This wasn't a good start. Alex Carey made up for his drop two overs later. Edge, and this time he takes the catch. England's top order looked brittle again. Yeah! Oh, beautifully done. Except for Zach Crawley, who scored an entertaining 77 before being trapped by Cameron Green. Oh, gee, that is out. That brought Joe Root and Ben Stokes together. England's two biggest stars determined to stop Australia's march to victory. Takes it on and puts it away beautifully. When rain rolled in at lunch, play was delayed for an hour. The tourists becoming increasingly hopeful of hanging on. Stokes, two steps, bangs it down the ground to finish the over. But Root fell just before tea. Scotty Boland knocks over the England captain again. Leaving Australia six wickets for victory in the last session. Stokes smashed his way to 60 before the danger man was dismissed by Nathan Lyon. Stokes furious he exposed the tail with good reason. Captain Cummins claiming Butler and Wood in the same over. When Boland got Bairstow, the win was in sight. Is that it? Is that it? Is it taken? It is! 
With England's lower order counting down every ball, Australia turned in desperation to Steve Smith. It's taken! But as a nervous dugout watched on with one wicket remaining, veteran Stuart Broad and Jimmy Anderson blocked out the final overs, finally giving the visitors something to be proud of on a horror tour. Luke Duffersey, Nine News. Inform Perth Scorchers batter Colin Munro has missed tonight's clash against the Sixers after testing positive to COVID-19. The Scorchers chasing 152 for victory. The Sixers off to a fast start before Ashton Agar did the damage. Oh, yeah. it's a beauty from Ashton Agar. And boy, did he love it. Acting Stars captain Adam Zampa questioning the integrity of pushing ahead. The Stars forced to face the Renegades in Monday's derby despite having 12 infected players. These competitions are built on days like that and I think the derby day was taking the piss out of a little bit. Um... After tonight's clash, the Scorchers next face the Stars on Tuesday. Ash Barty has won the Adelaide International as she continues her dream run into the Australian Open. The world number one taking care of Alina Rybakina in straight sets in just 64 minutes. But you guys are fans have made this week exceptional for me. Uh, you've made it so much fun and uh, you've brought that spark back into my tennis and I thank you so much for that. I, I really do appreciate it. Barty back out on court just hours later, winning the first set in the doubles final with West Aussie Storm Sanders. Fremantle is preparing to hit the road with four points in the bank after defeating West Coast in last night's Western Derby. The Eagles eyeing a quick bounce back from the 28-point loss as the two sides head east until the WA border opens. A new year, but the same story. The Dockers too strong for the Eagles. Antonio, a bullet! A miracle! West Coast taking the fight to their crosstown rivals. Schmidt on debut for the Eagles, around the body and home! One kickball game in the derby! A Dockers onslaught in the fourth quarter, putting the game beyond doubt. It was just a matter of taking opportunities when we got them and it sort of broke open late. The team's now packing for hub life in Melbourne. We're really looking forward to getting away together and uh, yeah, seeing how many of those uh, four games we can, we can win. We look forward to the hub. It's a great challenge for our girls to go away and in this competition, if you want to be the best, you have to beat the best anywhere in Australia. Both clubs adamant the trip east won't be extended any further. Yeah, pretty confident everyone I'm speaking to is saying that uh, yeah, Feb 5 will be the day, uh, if not before. So, yeah, we're pretty confident with that. Out of our control, um, we dearly hope that we can come back and play some games at MRP in front of our fans. The Crows off to a flying start, getting revenge in the grand final replay, defeating the Lions by five goals. While a knee injury to reigning joint league MVP Brianna Davey has put a sour note on the Pies' win over the Blues. Mitch Turner, Nine News. A Perth cyclist is making the most of being stuck overseas during the COVID pandemic, targeting the courses of some of the world's toughest races. Jack Thompson even completing the prestigious Tour de France in half the time of this year's peloton. It's the most famous race in world cycling. Cadell Evans, the first Australian to win the Tour de France. In Perth, and we'd stay up late at night watching the Tour de France, and it was always like a bit of a dream as a kid, like, well, one day maybe I could, could ride this thing. Jack Thompson taking on the 23-day ride in a unique way. And so I had this idea, you know, like, why can't I live out that childhood dream and actually ride the Tour de France, but do it in my own way? Three years of planning and COVID delays for a week and a half blitz. I worked out that I could ride the Tour de France in half the time of the pro peloton, so 10 days. The West Aussie pedalling an average of 14 hours a day for a total of 127 hours and 3,500 kilometres. Where the riders transferred in cars, I also transferred in cars, so it was an apples for apples comparison. Then throw in some slippery conditions. It's like the roads are flooding back there. I was forced to, to basically spend yeah, eight of the ten days riding in the rain, which was mentally very challenging. <laughs> As a Perth boy, like I'm, I'm not used to the rain. The 30-year-old riding to shed light on mental health. Battling through depression. 
the bike was always a bit of a savior. It hasn't stopped me from from achieving cool things and you know undertaking massive goals. Setting his own pace on one of the world's most iconic courses, giving pro riders a 10-day head start. And we beat the Tour de France Peloton to Paris by three days. <laughs> My celebration meal at the end of it all was McDonald's because nothing else was open. Thompson next feasting on a Portugal marathon. It sort of will span five months, so it's a, it's a really long one. Natalia, if I had two months, I'm not sure I could complete the Tour de France. What an <laughs> unbelievable effort by a West Aussie boy and for such a great cause for mental health. Yeah, such a great cause. And I think it would take me about two years, Bonnie. So <laughs> <laughs> you're doing better <laughs> than me. Both. Good on him. They breed them tough out here in WA, don't we they? Do. <laughs> <laughs> Next, preparing for WA's border reopening. Do rabbit tests work and how do you use them? Plus, what was this mystery fireball heading straight for Perth's hills? And Elizabeth Creasy, the Mercury, is set to climb. Natalia, it'll be a sunny Monday with a top of 30 degrees and it will warm up from there before a much cooler end to the week. I'll have the details coming up soon. Welcome back. Let's take a look at the biggest headlines making news in Perth this evening. Perth nightclub owners are accusing the McGowan government of double standards after a last minute proof of vaccination backflip at the AFLW Derby. The supply chain crisis over east has hit WA with supermarket shelves across Perth stripped bare. A bushfire in Wooraloo has threatened lives and homes, destroying five hectares of land and there are fears it was the work of an arsonist. And a push by our government to delay Novak Djokovic's court hearing has failed as images emerge of him mingling with fans while apparently COVID positive. Rapid antigen tests are expected to be available in some WA pharmacies from tomorrow as the ban on the devices lifts. And tonight we have a step-by-step -step guide on how to use the kits properly. Most of us aren't used to sticking things up our nose, so using a nasal swab can feel unnatural, but if you do it correctly, it shouldn't hurt. Aiming up, uh, the roof of the nose is very narrow, so it can be really painful. So turning the swab down and back will give you a better direction and a better sampling. So going slowly around the back, following the floor of the nose and then doing a good twirl and then pulling it back slowly. Pushing two to three centimetres deep for an adult and no more than two centimetres for a child. If you're doing it with your children, you might give your child a hug while resting their head um, on your arms. Nasal swabs are designed to only go up your nose. They shouldn't be used to swab your throat. If you do, this could interfere with your result. Saliva tests are also approved and available in Australia. Some tests uh, advice that says you shouldn't be eating or drinking for 30 minutes before. For either test, once you have your sample inside the test tube with the provided liquid, swirl for 15 seconds before placing droplets into the well next to the reader. It is important that you follow these steps correctly, using the instructions in your kit to get the most accurate result. One red line will appear next to the C if you're negative. A second line will appear next to the T if you're positive. This line can be very faint. A test is never 100% perfect, so you could actually have a false negative. If you do have symptoms, I would recommend to get a more accurate testing with a PCR test. Sophie Upcroft, Nine News. If you saw what looked like a meteor headed straight for Perth's hills overnight, you weren't mistaken. This clip was captured on dash cam and made available just after 8 o'clock last night. The Perth Observatory says the meteor was likely the size of a small rock and on display was its fiery death as it entered Earth's atmosphere. Staying on that intergalactic theme, the final petal-like mirror of NASA's new $10 billion telescope has unfurled into position. The James Webb telescope is 100 times more more sensitive than its little brother, the Hubble telescope. It will allow astronomers to peer through clouds of gas and dust, effectively back in time to watch stars and galaxies form. Very cool. Living to 180 years old could soon be a reality. Well, by the end of the century at least, no one has ever celebrated a 123rd birthday, but data from Canadian scientists predicts some people will be living to 130 by 
by the year 2100. It's thought the most extreme super centenarians, that's quite a hard word to say, will live to 180. Stay with us. Elizabeth Creasy is back with all of your weather details for the week ahead. It's coming up right after this break. Welcome back. It's been a very windy weekend and those strong gusts are going to stick around for the next couple of days as well. The southerly has helped to generate much cooler conditions today. We've had a top of just 25 degrees this afternoon and right now it's hovering around 21.5. Now on the satellite, tropical cyclone Tiffany has now formed in waters off far north Queensland. At the moment it is a category one system but is expected to strengthen into a category two by tomorrow when it makes landfall. While here in the west, another trough will start to deepen down the coast from Tuesday, which will mean a return of the hotter weather. Looking into state, it'll be hot and cloudy in Adelaide tomorrow, 21 to 35 degrees. Canberra could get a storm, 30 the top, and it will be mostly sunny in Melbourne, 29. Back in the west, temperatures in Marble Bar and Newman will rise into the 40s tomorrow, while towns along the coast will be much cooler, 34 degrees in Broome and 35 in Port Hedland. In the south, Augusta is looking windy, 14 to 24 degrees. Albany and Esperance will be cool and cloudy, while the rest of the region will be mostly sunny. Winds will ease tomorrow, but it'll still be a little gusty along the coast in Perth. Seas will be remaining quite high at two and a half metres. Looking around our suburbs, we will have a top of 30 degrees in Kalamunda, Joondalup and Ocean Reef. A little cooler in Swanbourne, 28 degrees, a top of 29 for most other areas. We will have a nice breezy night tonight with the temperature dipping down to 15 degrees. A sunny 30 will be the maximum tomorrow afternoon. We will see a large jump in the temperature on Tuesday, getting up to 37 degrees in the city, remaining very warm on Wednesday, 23 to 36, but it will cool down quite quickly after that, a top of 29 on Thursday and Friday, dipping down to 28 on Saturday, and we'll have a top of 32 degrees to see out next weekend. So plenty of beautiful days heading our way soon, Natalia. Yeah, and some hot ones too. Liz, thank you. And that is Nine News this Sunday. Thanks so much for your company. Enjoy the rest of your evening. From all of us, good night.